We have been looking at the book of Judges in the last few weeks. The book of Judges is a challenging book of the Bible. And the truth is, sometimes we come across scriptures that are just challenging. We don't know what to do with them. And the passage we're going to look at today is one of those passages. The truth is, sometimes we, we just have to remember a little about it. Trying to find the context of a passage, remembering that this is the, the word of God, but that he's given us a, a mind to help interpret it. He's given us the ability to reason. He's given us um, the traditions of, the, of 2,000 years of Christians following him, trying to, to work out exactly what it looks like being a disciple of Jesus. Well, I was watching uh, a baseball game the other day, and one of the Yankees players, he hit the ball, and it was high, and it was far, and he broke into a slow little home run trot, and he rounded first base, and the guy had fielded the, hit the ball, hit the wall, bounced back to the fielder, and the guy threw him out because he was jogging slowly. And I thought, what was that guy thinking? What was that guy thinking? If he had run fast, it probably would have been a double. Sometimes you hear a story that just makes you say, what were they thinking? I don't remember the specifics, but I know, I remember when my son was younger, we came across the show, uh, America's Dumbest Criminals. And just the title of it made us laugh, because there are sometimes when you think, what were they thinking? And sometimes that can have not so humorous consequences. I heard a story or I read a story this week of a woman who was saying when she was a child, if she would get sick, uh, her mother would tell her, God is punishing you because you've gone out from the umbrella of his protection. <clears throat> She'd say, this is why you're sick. You must have done something to be punished. And then there's things that, there's other things that make you scratch your head and say, what were they thinking? I remember a few years ago, there was the, the church that protested soldiers' funerals. And then they celebrated when there was a, a mass murder at a gay nightclub. You think, what? What were they thinking? You don't celebrate that. What are they thinking? And maybe the big question I ask sometimes is I ask, do they really understand who God is? Because there's a difference between knowing about God and getting to know God. There's other examples in history. There was the, the Roman, Roman Emperor Constantine who uh, adopted Christianity but didn't want to be baptized until he was on his deathbed because he was afraid that, uh, that he wanted to be able to go and sin and have his sins taken care of just before he died so we wouldn't commit any more. You think, that just doesn't sound right. What was he thinking? There's different things kind of you might call folk theology, like do we really believe the devil has pointy ears and a pitchfork? Do we really believe people become angels after they die? There's some who would believe that when we die, if we're good followers of Jesus, we can become a god of our own world. And I think, what are they thinking? That's not really what the Bible teaches. I once knew a guy who was abused and called a child of the devil when he was young because he was left-handed. And I think, what are they thinking? There's a lot of things in this world that make me think that. And I'm sure you do. I've heard people say God must approve of violence because the Old Testament is violent. God must approve of multiple wives because people in the Old Testament had multiple wives. And of course, that's, that's silly. It's just looking at it wrong. I've heard people say when, you were, when someone's caught stealing, you should cut their hand off because in Matthew 5, Jesus says... If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one body part than for your whole body to go into hell. And I think, well, 
I'm not sure he meant us to take it quite that literal. I think he was making a point. But people throughout history have come to all sorts of crazy ideas because they know a little about God, but they don't really know the character of God. It's kind of like this. Imagine that I have a, an acquaintance, somebody that recognizes my name, recognizes my face, and perhaps they know one thing about me. They know I like pizza. And so they decide to, to give me a gift and they give me a, a large pizza with feta cheese, anchovies, and cauliflower. Well, they knew I liked pizza, but what they didn't realize is those are my three least favorite foods in the world. I don't like cauliflower or anchovies and I can't eat feta. They know a little about me, but they don't really know me. And sometimes I feel like people get to know a little about God and then they stop. And they don't get to know him more deeply and they misunderstand who he is. I have heard people say theology doesn't matter, just believe in Jesus. But the truth is, theology matters. Theology is simply a big word that means the study of God. And if we're a disciple of Jesus, we are studying God together. We can't follow him without getting to know him. There was a poll recently that said, um, so they, they recorded people who they, who they felt were evangelical Christians and they 43% of them agreed that Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. And I think, what are they thinking? That's kind of the whole point of our faith. Jesus was more than a great teacher. He was God in the flesh. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. Interpreting scripture matters. Theology matters. Getting to know who God really is matters. Being a disciple of Jesus takes more than just saying, I love you. That's a good thing to, say, to tell Jesus you love him. But if you love him, you want to get to know him. How can you follow him if you don't know him? Now, in order to, to know Jesus better, there's a few things that really aren't that difficult we can do. We can read the Bible. Not just sections of it, but work our way through the whole thing. Get to know the whole Bible, not just a favorite verse. Spend time with others who know Jesus. Go to church, join a Bible study, have friends, have some friends who are Christians that you can do life together with. Study the Bible with others. Pray. These are all ways in which God reveals himself to us. And getting to know God matters. In Hebrews chapter 11, it mentions some people with a lot of faith who God used in mighty ways including four men whose stories are told in the book of Judges. They were men who God did amazing things through. And at times they had great faith, but that doesn't mean they were perfect. We need to understand that. It doesn't mean we should, uh, it doesn't mean they always got it right. It means God used them at times in spite of themselves. I got a friend who, uh, Sometimes when he's working on a project, we'll do it, and through the work that he's doing, he will actually discover the solution, and it's something different than what he was doing. And he'll say, I'm such an idiot. And the truth is, don't we all do that? Sometimes we just think, oh, what was I thinking? So it's not just other people. Sometimes we look at ourselves, and we think, what was I thinking? Sometimes I have to do something three or four times before I get it right. And the answer will seem so simple, I'll think, what was I thinking? And then I'll look back and say, oh, well, I may not have been thinking right, but I learned. I learned from my mistakes. There's some people mentioned in Hebrews 11. Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, prophets. It says uh, in Hebrews 11:33. Through faith they conquered kingdoms and brought about justice and realized promises. Uh, they shut the mouths of lions. But the uncomfortable truth is their faith God used, but they may have used to conquer kingdoms and bring justice and to fulfill promises and shut the mouths of lions. But 
It didn't stop them from occasionally being idiots. And I say that affectionately. Think of Gideon. We talked about him a couple weeks in, in our service. When Gideon was finished being used by God in amazing ways, he made this golden ephod, a, a priestly garment, and his children ended up worshiping that gold, that golden idol as an idol. They worshiped that thing made of gold instead of God. That was Gideon's children. What was he thinking? There was Barak who refused to go into battle unless Deborah went with him. What was he thinking? Just obey God. There was Samson. God told the Israel, Israelites to never marry outside of the people of Israel. So what Samson do? He tried to marry a Philistine. Then he visits a Philistine prostitute. And then he's seduced by another Philistine named Delilah. God ended up using Samson in mighty ways. But at times you look at his life and you think, what was he thinking? The Bible is not the story of holy men and women always doing the right thing. It's the story of a holy God and a sinful people and the lengths to which God would go to rescue his people. The Bible relates the stories of sinful people who need a savior. And it reveals the promise and fulfillment of that savior in Jesus. Now today, as we continue to look through the book of Judges, we're going to look at the tragic story of Jephthah. Jephthah was used by God, but then experienced an unnecessary tragedy because he didn't fully understand God's character. If you have your Bibles, you, you can turn with me if you want it. Judges chapter 11, we're going to look at the first 11 verses. Now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty warrior. Gilead was his father, but he was a prostitute son. Gilead's wife gave birth to other sons for him. And when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah away. They told him, you won't get an inheritance in our father's household because you're a different woman's son. So Jephthah ran away from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. Worthless men gathered around Jephthah and became his posse. That's kind of a, a modern translation. Worthless men gathered around Jephthah, and they kind of just became his gang, his group, his people he hung out with. Sometimes, after, sometime afterward, the Ammonites made war against Israel. And when the Ammonites attacked Israel, Gilead's elders went to bring Jephthah back from the land of Tob. They said to him, come be our commander so we can fight against the Ammonites. But Jephthah replied to Gilead's elders, Aren't you the ones who hated me and drove me away from my father's household? Why are you coming to me now when you're in trouble? Gilead's elders answered Jephthah, That may be, but now we're turning back to you. So come with us and fight the Ammonites, and then you'll become the leader over us and everyone who lived in Gilead. And Jephthah said to Gil Gilead's elders, if you bring me back to fight the Ammonites and the Lord gives them over to me, I alone will be your leader. Gilead, Gilead's elders replied to him, The Lord is our witness. We will surely do what you have said. So Jephthah went with Gilead's elders, and the people made him leader and commander over them. At Mizpah, before the Lord, Jephthah repeated everything he had said. Jephthah is an interesting Character. If we try to read behind the lines of this story so far a little bit, he wasn't, he doesn't seem to be typical hero material. He sounds like he was a little bit wild. It sounds like he didn't have the greatest upbringing. It sounds like he wasn't treated very well. His mom was a prostitute. He wasn't born of a virgin or a particularly pious woman or in some heroic act. He was the child of a prostitute. He wasn't the promised child of a devout married couple. He was the father, he was born the son of a father who did something he shouldn't have. His brothers hated him. They drove him away. 
He was not their mother's son. He did, they didn't want anything to do with him. He was a product of their father's sin. They didn't want anything to do with him. They didn't want him to inherit anything from their father because that was theirs and they didn't want to share it with him. They didn't see him as a true brother. So they drove him away. Meanwhile, Jephthah, as in some stories, you know, it's not a happy turn of events with this story. He doesn't go off and have a special experience with God, at least not at first. It says he went out to another town and began to hang out with the wrong crowd. Most of the translations say worthless people. He started hanging out with the wrong crowd. The contemporary English Bible calls them a posse. The NIV calls them scoundrels. The King James Version calls them vain. And the New King James Version just calls them worthless men. This is who Jephthah hung out with. This was Jephthah's people. They weren't good people. And Jephthah gathered them around him. Jephthah, it seems, had a reputation, and it wasn't a good one. I thought to myself, you know, Jephthah must have had a reputation as a fighter. Because if he didn't have a reputation as a fighter, why did these brothers and the, the elders of Gilead come and ask him to come and lead them into battle? Somehow they knew he was a good fighter. Sometime, somehow they knew he was a mighty warrior. He must have had a reputation. He must have proven himself to be a fighter. Whether this was with his brothers when he was young or later when he had a gang of his own, we don't know that. But apparently the elders, including his brothers, thought he was their best chance. Imagine how humbling it must have been for the brothers to go and recruit Jephthah to be their leader. And the truth is, one thing we can see about Jephthah, God can and will use anybody. God will use anybody he wants. Jephthah was used by God. Absolutely. There was a war between his family's tribe and the Ammonites. And things must have been going really badly for Gilead in the war with the Ammonites if his brothers were willing to put him in charge. Then in continuing in, in chapter uh, 11, in verses 12 to 28, Jephthah tries to make peace with the Ammonites. He shows some wisdom. He tries to make peace with the Ammonites by appealing to history and trying to explain the context of how they had gotten to this place. That's always a wise thing. When you have a problem, the first thing you ought to ask is, how did we get here? And then it actually says, the spirit came upon Jephthah. The spirit comes upon him and he marches his soldiers through town after town, marching out to face the Ammonites. I read verse 29 and I see God was, God was already marching them to victory. In verse 29 it says, the spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah. He crossed Gilead and Manasseh and passed through Mizpah and Gilead. And from there, he advanced against the Ammonites. This was it. The Spirit of the Lord was with him. God was at work in his life using him. God had taken the, the illegitimate child who was bullied by his brothers, who had been a fighter and hung out with people that weren't the kindest people. And now God had brought him front and center. And he was leading his family, his people in the battle. God was at work in his life. The spirit of the Lord was on him. He was crossing from their land into the land of the Ammonites. They were ready to go. He was on the verge of victory. God had already brought him this far. Did he really think God was just going to leave him and let him fail now? God wasn't going to abandon him. But then, right on the verge of his victory, Jephthah did something stupid. And some of the, that's, that may not be the nicest word, but sometimes people just do things and you think, they should have known better. What were they thinking? Skip down to verses 
30 to 39, it says this. Jephthah made a solemn promise to the Lord. If you will decisively hand over the Ammonites to me, then whatever comes out the doors of my house to meet you, to meet me, when I return victorious from the Ammonites, will be given over to the Lord. I will sacrifice it as an entirely burned offering. Jephthah crossed over to fight the Midianites and the Lord handed them over to him. It was an exceptionally great defeat. He defeated 20 towns from Ero to the area of Minith and on as far as Abakaram. So the Ammonites were brought down before the Israelites. But then Jephthah came to his house in Mizpah and it was his daughter that came out to meet him with tambourines and dancing. She was an only child. He had no other son or daughter except her. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Oh no, my daughter, you brought me to my knees. You are my agony, for I opened my mouth to the Lord, and I can't take it back. But she replied to him, My father, you've opened your mouth to the Lord, so you should do to me just as you promised. After all, the Lord carried out just punishment for you on for you on your enemies, the Ammonites. Then she said to her father, let this one thing be done for me. Hold off for two months and let me and my friends wander the hills in sadness, crying over the fact that I will never have children. Go, he responded, and he sent her away for two months. She and her friends walked the hills and cried because she would never have children. When two months passed, she returned to her father, and he did to her what he had promised. She had not known a man intimate, intimately, she, but she gave rise to a tradition in Israel where for 40, uh, where for, for, for four days every year, Israelite daughters go away to recount the story of Gilead, the Gileadite Jephthah's daughter. Despite what God was already doing in his life, Jephthah decided he was going to try to negotiate, to bargain with God. If you do this, I'll do that. God was already using him. God was already leading him. God's spirit had already fallen on him. What more did God need to do? Jephthah makes this promise. He tries to bargain with God. He promised God he would make a burnt offering of the first thing that comes out of his house if God gives him victory. The first thing I think of is, what on earth did he think was going to come out of his house? Did he think it was going to be an animal, a servant? I don't know, but what was he thinking? I believe this is the truth about Jephthah. He didn't fully know God enough to understand God's character. Jephthah was a man of poor theology, and his poor theology was destructive. Didn't he understand God's desire is for our, our obedience, not our sacrifices or bargains? The, jo the daughter's joy and his innocence makes this feel all the more tragic. She's obedient and trusting, and the truth is she probably doesn't seem to know God any more deeply than her father does. I don't think Jephthah knew God as well as he thought he did. And this is where we come back to the idea, Scripture matters. God had spoken to Jephthah's people over the years. Jephthah's people were the, were the people of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Jephthah's people were the, the people that God uh, used Moses to lead them out of slavery in Egypt. The people who Joshua had led to the promised land and through victory after victory. Jephthah should have known the stories of his people, the scriptures of his people, the law of his people. Didn't he know in Deuteronomy 12, 31, God told the people of Israel not to act like the other nations around them? Don't act like they did towards the Lord your God, because they did things for their gods that are detestable to the Lord, which he hates. They even burned their own sons and daughters with fire for their gods. Jephthah does exactly what God told the people of Israel not to. 
Apparently, he wasn't familiar with that scripture. In Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 and 10, it says, Once you are in the land that the Lord your God is giving you, don't try to imitate the detestable things those nations do. They must not be anyone among you who passes his son or daughter through the flame. The people, the, the pagan um, peoples around the people of this Israel, the different tribes of people that Jephthah knew, they had their own pagan religions. They did not worship the Lord God. They did not worship the, the Lord God of the God of his ancestors. And in their worship practice, practices, they did some horrible things, including child sacrifice. And here we find Jephthah imitating the practices of the people around him. And I think, you know, didn't he understand that's not what God wanted? Didn't he know that when Exodus speaks of the firstborn sons belonging to the Lord, it demands that they be redeemed by paying a price, a monetary sacrifice to symbolically buy them back from the Lord, not that they be killed. Jephthah, this was a promise that was totally out of God's character. It was a promise that Jephthah didn't have to follow through with. There was a, a plan in place where he could have purchased back his daughter's life. The story of Jephthah shows us that if we don't know the whole of Scripture and we only know a little bit, we're not going to get an accurate picture of who God is. If this was the only story from the Bible that we knew, what would you think about God? What picture would you have of him and his character? We do have more than this story, though. We have the story of, of Genesis when God saw his beautiful world, his amazing people, fall into sin. And he saw the death and the destruction that that brought about. We read that he set forth a plan at that point that he was going to someday redeem his people. We can read, yes, of how God used the, called the Israelites, the descendants of Abraham. And he used them and led them, led them from slavery to freedom. He established them as a people of his own. He revealed himself to them in amazing ways. God was using them to reveal himself to the world. And we have the advantage over Jephthah. We have the, the writings of the prophets and we see how God again and again called a sinful people to repent. We have the stories of the promises of God to, to be the savior we need, to send the, the savior we need. We have the, the Psalms and the different wisdom writings to help us understand who God is. The story of Jephthah shows us that if we don't know the whole of Scripture, if we don't see, the, see Scripture as a whole rather than something to pick apart here and there, we're going to miss fully understanding the character of God. And when I say fully, I mean as fully as we can. Someday we're going to get to heaven and we're going to just be amazed when we really fully grasp who God is. But my point is theology matters. It matters what we believe about God. Interpreting scripture matters. It matters how we take the words found in our Bible and understand them. Getting to know God matters. In the midst of a sinful, fallen world, God's greatest desire is that we should get to know him. Sometimes people do ungodly things in the name of God because they are more of an acquaintance with God than a friend of God. God doesn't call us to a shallow, superficial relationship with him. Ultimately, God became flesh and blood and dwelt among us. In Jesus, we see God fully revealed. He has gifted us with scripture, God inspired human beings to write, and in those writings we find revealed the God who loved us so much that he gave his one and only son 
that whosoever would believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. We won't find a full picture of God by pulling out one verse here or there and applying it literally to a particular problem, person, or situation. We find God in the whole story, the whole Bible. The Bible helps us interpret the Bible. If one verse seems odd or uncharacteristic of God, then we look at the bigger picture. What else does the Bible say about this? The Bible, like any other writing, any other writing is, is most often meant to be taken literally, but at times uses figures of speech to make a point. In it, we find narrative stories, we find poetry and songs, we find parables and letters. We find visions and dreams, and understanding the context of that helps us to determine how we interpret it. It's not a legal document like our, like say the Constitution, in which each clause can be taken and examined separately. The Bible is the story of God's involvement in the lives of sinful people living in a fallen world. It's the story of how we got here and what he has done to save us. God has also gifted us with the church, with each other. As we examine scriptures together, we, as we interpret it together, as we pray together and seek God together, we gain a deeper understanding of who God is. The church has been reading scripture and praying and living a spirit-filled life together for over 2,000 years. And we can learn from both our successes and failures of the past about who we are who God is, and who we are called to be in this world. We are God's gift to each other. We also have our own personal experiences of prayer and living and giving witness to how God has changed us and used us and done amazing things in our own lives. And perhaps we can also look back at a couple of points in our own life and think, man, what was I thinking? I was such an idiot when I did that, or when I thought that, or when I... Perhaps you'll look back at your own life, and I'll look back at my life and think, at that moment in time, what was I thinking? But know this, God loves you. He has called you to follow you, to follow him, and he has given us the means by which to get to know him better. So as a church, we say, come follow us as we follow Jesus together and we will celebrate what God does. We're going to close by sharing in communion together. Communion is one of those moments where Jesus demonstrates for us, through an illustration in a sense, of who he is and what he has come to do. If we think back to the night in which Jesus sat reclining at a table, with some disciples who were bickering, some who didn't fully understand what he was doing, one who betrayed him. And we could look at different moments and think, what, what were they thinking? But Jesus sat in their midst. Jesus loved them. And on that night, he, he broke a loaf of bread and he passed it out to them. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. He took he took uh, the wine and he passed it around. He said, drink from this. Drink and know that this, my blood is shed for you. Amazing. And then the next day, he went and he lived out the broken bread. He lived out the spilled wine, the spilled blood. And it's in that sacrifice that we, we find our salvation. It's in that sacrifice that we can be redeemed from those what was I thinking moments. It's in that sacrifice that we find who God really is and how much he really loves us and what his hope really is for the world. And we remember that he said for us to follow him. May the love of God and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. God bless you and enjoy your afternoon.